Your job as a leader when you're in an organization is to make the organization successful, get everyone to work towards the mission of the organization. And I think a lot of leaders get caught up in, well, as long as I can be the best leader and do my job well, that's all that counts. But what I learned at Disney, you know, being at the Magic Kingdom, for example, um, I had, you know, 12,000 employees in my organization. And if my leadership wasn't translating to our guests having great experiences with frontline employees, because that's who they talked to, the guests had no idea who I was. And they didn't care who I was. All they knew was I pull up at the auto plaza, is this person friendly and welcoming, and do they know what they're doing? Do they park my car safely? Do they drive the tram safely and talk to me? Do they answer my questions? And you, know, you can go through the hundreds of interactions you'd have with someone in a theme park or all the employees in a theme park. If my leadership was not making that better, then... I wasn't doing my job. We believe that you are strong by design and you were made in God's image to have a strong body, mind, and spirit. You're listening to the number one strength and health authority podcast in the world. So let's get ready to unlock your potential and transform your life in today's episode. Well, hey, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of the Strong by Design podcast. Uh, my name is Jared. I am one of the hosts here. And uh, man, we just, uh, I'm always excited because we have so many incredible guests that we get to have a chance to chat with. And uh, not only is that beneficial for me as getting to interview different people, but I mean, really our hope is that it's it's beneficial to you as well as the listener that you are able to uh, grow and become strong by design in every era uh, in every area of your life. Uh, we believe that you were created strong by design. You were created to be strong physically, to be strong mentally, and to be strong physically. And so, uh, through the various people that we get to chat with, uh, we we just trust that they're helping you grow in in every one of those areas of your life. And today is no different. We have an incredible guest uh, on our show today. Uh, this is a man who has uh, an incredible resume. Uh, he has an incredible uh, experience all over the world, not just uh, in the United States, but in places like uh, France and uh, I'm sure other places that that he'll, I just learned Australia is about to uh, just get a, a huge new bump in, in the Australian area. So, yeah. uh, but he's a, a business leader. He's a coach uh, and author of the book, uh, how's the culture in your kingdom? We're going to tackle that a little bit today as well. Uh, has a podcast. Uh, at least you had a podcast. I don't know if that's continuing or not. We can discuss that a little bit later. Um, getting ready to uh, be part of, I don't know if it's a launching or a boosting of a university in Australia. Uh, I mean, so many things going on. I just Dan, I'll introduce you. Dan Cockrell is on the show with us today. And so, Dan, thank you so much for your willingness to come and, and and share a little bit of your wisdom and life experience with us. Thanks, Jared. I love uh, I love doing these podcasts. It's so much fun to to chat and talk about what's on people's minds and share what I can about my experiences. Absolutely. Um, so, Dan, uh, just kicking stuff off, uh, we we were just talking uh, before we we started recording uh, that you're you're currently in this life change into a, a phase where uh, I know for. I believe it's 26 years you were working with Disney. Uh, you left Disney and you're doing some some consulting and coaching and business leadership stuff. But now, uh, I, I'm, I won't ask you how old you are because I don't think that, that that's nice to do. Uh, maybe it is nice. Maybe you don't care. I don't uh, care. But <laughs> I, I will say, now that you're 29 years old again, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a crazy time to be doing another life change and a night a life switch and moving to a completely new culture. Uh, but tell me what what's going on in the life of Dan uh, today? Yeah, so Jared, uh, you know your your first point. I, I as I'm getting older, I'm starting to see my life in very clear chapters. Uh, you don't see them while you're doing them, but you certainly see them as behind you. And uh, the first big chapter was joining Disney right out of university, right out. I went to Boston University and joined Disney as a frontline employee in the parking lot at Epcot and uh, worked there for six months and then had the opportunity to go to France and open Disneyland Paris. And that was sort of the first chapter, I'd say the first five years out of college living in France. And uh, my wife, Valerie, is from France and we both worked there. And then in 97, the next chapter, we moved to Florida and we spent the next gosh, 21 years uh, working at Walt Disney World. And during that time, we raised three kids. 
um, had uh, 19 different jobs over the 26 year period with the Walt Disney Company and just had incredible uh, education about how to work in a world class organization and uh, learning about culture, leadership, uh, systems, design. I love design. When you design things, everything else gets easier. Uh, and we can talk more about that. And then uh, back in 2018, our third, uh, our, our third child, Tristan, our youngest son, uh, went off to college and Valor and I started talking about what the next chapter was going to be. And we decided to do one of the most, the most scariest things in my life was leaving Disney and uh, heading off. And we've been consulting for five and a half years. Um, Valerie was with Disney for 16 years and she was a facilitator at the Disney Institute and I had done a lot of speaking. So we created our company and we've been doing uh, leadership workshops, customer service, uh, keynote speeches, consulting all over the world for the past five and a half years. And then the next chapter came about and we, uh, I, I, I got a new job on December 1st of 2023 and I'm going to be the CEO of uh, Torrens University, which is based in Australia. It was uh, started about 10 years ago and it's Australia's only investor-owned university. It's owned by an American company, Strategic Education. And uh, there was an opportunity. The, the CEO there was transitioning out. She started it and she was moving it, transitioning on. And I called someone I'd worked with previously, and it was just perfect timing. He said, Dan, I may have an opportunity for you. So uh, that conversation was October 23rd. And we are, um, I've been down twice now down there. We'll be moving there permanently in March uh, to run this university. We both have four year visas, and uh, we'll be there till, I don't know, till the next chapter reveals yeah. itself. Yeah, that's a lot. That's awesome. Um, what is there, what's the focus then of the school? Yeah. So it's a, it's a really cool school, um, because it's 10 years old and is very dynamic, very nimble and agile. Um, it has, uh, it's, uh, it's got a few different schools. So it has campuses in four cities in Australia, um, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and Adelaide. And, uh, they have a fifth campus in Auckland, uh, New Zealand. And their, their three big verticals are health, business and design. So they have a fashion design school, the Billy Blue Fashion Design School. They have the Media Design School that's based in Auckland that does a lot around uh, media, video production. Um, they have a, a hotel and hospitality school just outside of City Blue Mountains House Hotel and Hospitality. And then they have a, a nursing school within Torrens. And then they offer uh, business degrees, um, um, IT. We're starting to get into architecture uh, so I'm still in the big learning curve here, Yeah, but they're in a little bit of Man. everything. And it's, uh, to your point, I'm, I'll, I'll be 55, uh, in about two weeks and Valor and I, we've always, we've always decided that whatever our age is, it doesn't matter. We're just going to treat life like we're just getting out of college and we're just keep, we try to stay fit and eat right. So we have enough energy to sort of do all this because we expend a lot of energy when we make these changes. But, um, you know, we, we feel like life is short and you got to go, you know, whatever diverse experiences you can get is, uh, is worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. Uh, where, how did you, inv I mean, I know that Valerie was working at Disney, but w what's the origin story there? Yeah. So she, she grew up in Lyon, France in the South of France. And when she was 16, her cousin called her and said, Hey, I'm moving to London. Do you want to come? And so she moved to London when she was 16 years old. She didn't speak a word of English. And she became an au pair and, and took care of a, a little boy who was a, a son of a, a backup singer in a band. And he, she did that for a year and a half. And when she left London, when she was 17 and a half, she spoke perfect English and moved back to France. And one of her professors in college said, hey, your English is better than mine. Uh, th they had this program at Walt Disney World uh, at Epcot. There's a the place called the World Showcase. And they recruit uh, students from all over the world to represent each of the country pavilions within World Showcase. And so she went to Paris. She interviewed for that. She went over on the J-1 visa and worked at the French pavilion uh, on the fellowship program for a year. And um, at the end of that year, she she traveled to Mexico and eventually made her way back to France. And then in 1991, uh, Euro Disney was going to be opening the following year. And they went to their Rolodex and said, okay, let's find all the Europeans who ever worked at Disney and see if they'd like to be on the opening crew. And they called her. And she said, yes, I'll do it. So she moved to Florida. And after she moved to Florida, about three weeks later, I moved to Florida from Boston University. 
she lived on the third floor. I lived on the first floor and I was doing my laundry one day and there was this cute French girl doing her laundry. So I, mm-hmm. I said, hi. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that, that day of saying hi back in 1991 turned into, we're our 30th. We've been married for 30 years now. So you never know. Okay. You never know where that next person is coming from. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. We just, uh, my wife and I, we just celebrated 15. So we're, we'll never catch up to you because we're always behind, but you know, obviously. <laughs> hey, it's not a competition, Jared, but, uh, oh, yeah, so. All right, so sorry. But, Here but, I know. But it, you yes. know, it takes uh, it takes a lot of work raising kids, yeah. and and uh, we've uh, we've talked a lot about that. And I think the the key, well, there's no key to a totally successful marriage, but we found mm-hmm. that you just got to overlook each other's shortfalls, and if you can do that, everything's yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because um, my wife and I, it was our 15 year anniversary, so I'm like, well, let's go do something fun. Uh, we we live in the Clearwater area anyway, but I'm like, let's just, we'll go stay on the beach. We'll do like a dinner cruise thing. You know, just, we'll get out for one night. And so, so we did that. And when we came back, uh, we, we, the valet came to, to get our car. I was up getting the rest of our bags and, uh, the valet asked my, my wife, she was like, why, why are you guys here? And she said, well, we're celebrating our 15 year anniversary. And her response was, that's it. (laughs) <laughs> like <laughs> just, what do you mean that, that's it she's like well we've been my husband and I have been married for 30 years and she's like hey, she's well like, good for you she's like I didn't know we were competing you asked me why we were here <laughs> exactly exactly so it, it's kind of a funny we, we have a lot of really fun stories that came out of that night of of weird kind of quirky things that had happened but that's, that's what made it a lot of fun so yeah um and it's it was just good to to get away uh we uh, shifting gears slightly here, just we had your dad on on the show a couple months ago, yeah. Leacock Roll, and uh, also did a lot of stuff with Disney. I was just curious. I mean, we got to know him a little bit, but are there any stories about Lee that you have uh, growing up that you find uh, maybe inspirational or humorous that that you yes. might want to share, or yeah. that he would be okay with me sharing? I guess maybe that's the right question. Yeah, I mean it's. It's interesting because when I talk to people as you get older, I said, you know, I don't, I don't have any, I can't think of any childhood dysfunction I had. I mean, maybe as I get older, I'll find something, but my parents, I was an only child and I had a a great childhood. I mean, uh, my mom and uh, my dad worked a lot, you know, he was traveling and working a lot. And when I got in high school, my junior and senior year of high school, he sort of made a commitment and said, I'm going to be there every weekend. I played football. And so he would go to Marriott and he was able to get like filet mignon and these great steaks and we'd cook them in the the, the cafeteria at the Wooten High School. So I'd always talk to my former football teammates. They're like, man, those are the best two years we ever ate (laughs) was before the the games. And he really wanted to, you know, have, be involved because that's what we're always worried about, right? We're working a lot and our kids are growing up and um, you blink and they're growing up and you're like, gosh, I, I wish I could have done things live differently, maybe spend some more time. So he was really um, focused in on that. And yeah. uh, we it, talked about that. We talked about being his intentionality uh, to yes. not just be home, but to be present when you're home. Yeah. Um, and that's, yep. that's something that, uh, I mean, I push that all the time and, and I'm always re-harping it with myself as well. Hey, when I get home, I actually want to be there with the kids, yes. you know, uh, my 12 year old still comes up to me and asks me to play with him, yes. you know, and I'm like, that's not going to last forever. So I want to, want to savor that as long as I can. Well, I'll tell you, every time your child asks you that, you drop everything and do it because <laughs> that's going to be, it's a very short window of, uh, of mm-hmm. your life before they get older. The other thing I think um, I used as a role model for my parents, um, they never really told me what to do. They never told me what they're like, we expect you to, you know, be an executive or we expect you to go to this university. They sort of were like, you know what, we're going to expose you to lots of different things. We traveled a lot and they they would, um, every time I was trying to figure something out, they would present the options and really let me make the decision. And I think it's a great way. And it really, you know, let me, led me into doing the things I, I really value in life and the kind of jobs I wanted to be in. And it's, it's a hard line to walk because you want to yeah, you, you know, you know what's best for your kids. You think, uh, and they don't know enough yet. And I think finding the line where you can guide them but not direct them is. Uh, and, yeah. and my parents did that really well. We've tried to do that with yeah. our kids. Think about that as like a, 
Like if this is this is my home and there's a fence around my home and as the child gets older, like the boundaries are, are also, you know, a- expanding. Sure. And so it's like you still, like when you're a baby, you have obviously no choices, right? I mean, everything has to be done for you. Right. But as you get older, it's like, okay, now you're now you're five years old. Within these boundaries, here's where you have that freedom. And so yep. it's always growing. To, and, and, you know, some, you know, we have four kids. So one of them, you know, their boundary may be way out here. And their 12-year-old brother, it still may be here because he hasn't quite figured out that, you know, the responsibility sure. factor, whatever it might be. So, um, but I think that that's, I love that, that they, he gave that, gave you that opportunity to make the choice. I think that's where rebellion really hits hard at when kids leave the home at 18 is because everything was decided for them. Right. And it's even just, I don't even know if it's intentional rebellion. Sometimes it's just curiosity. Yeah. Like, what is this thing that I've been kept from for so long? I want to experience it, you right. know? And so- Allowing them to experience those things within the safety of this boundary that I've given them, you know, without telling them and directing them. Every- so we've, we've just had this conversation literally a week ago. My wife and I have been talking about this with our kids as they get older and um, wanting them to, uh, you know, they'll come to us sometimes and say, what do you think about this? And we just turn it back on them. Well, what do you think about this? You know, and, and yeah. ha- have, you know, those teaching moments by asking questions as opposed to giving commands. It's a great way to do it. Yeah. Uh, so you have, is this, uh, I'm not sure, I'll, I'll just ask, is this your only book that you have? Is this one or do you have multiple books? No, that's it. How's the Culture in Your Kingdom okay. was my one and only. It was, um, it's funny, the, the, the reason for writing it was, well, there's a couple. Uh, one was someone told me, if you're going to go be a consultant and a speaker, you need to have a book because people are going to think you're smarter or more credible. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know what it yeah. is about that, but if you write a book, apparently you're, yep. you know more. And yeah. then- All of a sudden you know stuff. Yeah, I guess so. But the, the biggest reason for it was, you know, after live, working at Disney for 26 years, when, you, when you're in the same culture organization for so long, you really don't know what you know anymore because everything is just so natural because the culture has kind mm-hmm. of- yep. um, set the expectations for you. I compare it to like, I, I heard a, a, this story once, you know, two fish uh, swim up to each other and one's like, hey, how you doing? What, what do you what do you think about the the water? The other fish is like, mm-hmm. what's water? You know, because you're so immersed yeah. in it, you don't even know it's there. Mm-hmm. And so when I was putting the book together, the idea I had at the beginning was, oh, I want to write about what I know. And at first I said, well, I really don't know anything. I mean, I work at Disney, I do my stuff, but it's all part of, and then I started asking myself, well, okay, let's see, what, what do you know? You know how to communicate, oh, you know how to solve problems, you know how to build relationships. And the more I did, the more I went, I realized that I had a list and that kind of was how the chapters of the book came together. Yeah. Yeah. We're, my wife and I are trying to write a book together too. It, it's funny how just trying to organize things and keep the, like almost writing literally it hasn't worked like we thought that it would, sure. You know, and having to go back and redo things. So, um, I, I mean, what everything I, I loved just getting into the book um, because there's just so many parallels with what I understand works for for us, uh, and even really the the mantra of of this podcast, like right out the gate. Yeah, your first three things out of it is your physical well-being, your mental well-being, and you called it your your moral fitness, but which is really your spiritual well-being, right? I mean, that's that's what we're all about. Um, and uh, maybe we, let's just dive into that a little bit. Uh, your physical well-being. What do you do? What do you suggest um, when it comes to to maintaining health? Especially, I, I'll ask this question because uh, you've probably been doing it for a while. Health and fitness it seems to change every five to ten years about what they say is is good and what's right and what's healthy. So, what have you done that seems to work well for you? Yeah, so I think the first thing I'll talk about. There's four sections of the book: leading self, leading team, leading organization, leading change. And when we first wrote the book, the publisher suggested said, "You know, this really feels like a self help book. Uh, people expect a Disney management leadership book. Let's put." Uh, man, you know, lead self at the end because that's you know they they want to hear about how you manage teams and about how you do that at Disney, and I said you know that's the problem in life. Everyone puts their chapters of leading themselves and taking care of themselves at the end of their book, and they do everything uh-huh. else first. And I have found that when you're physically fit, you're mentally fit, you're organized, 
you're just a better human being. You're a better husband, wife, son, daughter, parent, employee, boss, uh, and that it, it all starts with that. So that's the reason it's in the beginning. And uh, you know, I'm not I'm not an expert um, on any of this. And I know there's fads that come in and out and exercise this. At the end of the day, what I can say is do something, right? And you know, whether you don't have to be a triathlete. Uh, or marathon, or just get out and walk around the block, uh, do some push-ups, uh, stretch. Uh, humans were meant to move. You know, ev- evolution. Ev- you know, even over the past, you know, since I was a little kid, I have to do. You have to do a lot less today than you used to have to do. You don't even have to roll up a car window anymore. You just hit a button and it goes up and down. There's elevators. There's, e- there's escalators. We just don't move as much. And with all the technology now, we're much more sedentary. And humans aren't supposed to be sedentary. They're supposed to be moving. They're supposed to be picking up stuff and walking and exercising. And so um, I don't have any specific uh, advice for anyone, except you got to get some physical fitness in your life. Uh, And not only is it going to make you feel better and you're going to be healthier, but your quality of life later in life will be better. I think that's something we don't think much about. Uh, with medicine today- You don't when you're young, for sure. Yeah, medicine and technology and everything is going to help us and your kids, I mean, they're probably, there's no doubt they're going to be probably live past 100 by the time because the, the way technology is is accelerating. But how many years do you want to be living where you can't walk around or you can't get up or you're just not feeling right? And so um, physical fitness, you got to do something and you got to find time. And you talked about, my dad talked about intentionality. It has to be part of your schedule like everything else is, eating, exercising, taking time, meetings at work, going to your kids' you know, sporting events or the or plays, exercise should be scheduled and it should be done. And like I said, you don't have to be a you don't have to be a, a world class athlete, but you you should be moving and you'll be in a lot better place. Yeah, just just mob- mobility, right? I mean the the fact that you could do stretches, you know, yeah. body weight stuff. You know, it doesn't have to be super heavy things, but making sure that you're 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 doing things to make sure you're staying mobile. Uh, my my wife. Uh, hurt her ankle uh, and it wasn't uh, a break it was just a, a very bad sprain and oh, those are the uh, worst sprains take a yeah it takes it's it, it happened in august and she's still struggling with it you yeah. know um and the the fact that she can't do the physical things that she was able to do before like that that starts to weigh on you a little bit you know you feel uh like you can't you can't do anything you know um and so uh really uh continuing to, to nurse that back to health so that she can get back to doing the physical activity that she likes to do. And and there's things that happen when we're physical um, with uh, endorphins and with uh, just the chemical things in our body. And, and it all ties together. You know, I, I always say, if I'm not eating right, uh, it's gonna, and if I'm not working out, then it's, it's not that I'm trying to become like, you know, beach body Jared or something like that. Right. You know, it's just that you trying to maintain that health that keeps me mentally healthy you know uh, it keeps my mind uh clear and moving forward and and if i'm not taking care of my my spiritual well-being i see that start to affect other parts of my life and how it's all it's all connected and intertwined you know yep and when you take care of yourself it builds confidence you have a better outlook on things and uh so it's uh it's a good place to be so uh, real quickly you know valor and i the past five and a half years we we travel 10 months a year which is one of the reasons I took this job because we want to settle down a little bit and just not tra- be in a different hotel every night. And um, so ironically, we have to move to Australia to settle down, but that's the plan. But but what I learned was, what I figured out was, you know, if you, you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign up for a gym. Well, we couldn't sign up for a gym because we're never here. And you could find a gym, but in all these countries. Are, so what I b- basically got down to is push-ups, sit-ups, planks, running, and uh, stretching. And that was my that was my workout routine. As long as I could do that, I'd be fine. I didn't need any equipment. I didn't have to worry about a membership. I didn't have to have all this stuff. And sometimes I think having um, having a very specific workout routine with weights and all that gets in the way of you know. Well, I, I can't make it to the gym today. It's not open yet, and so you skip it. And that's the worst thing you can do. So I'm a big fan of just keep it simple. Then the guilt and shame come in, right? And then yeah all of a sudden you're discouraged from doing it anyway. Right. So you wrote a really good story actually about you and your friends going on a trip. Uh, and I can't remember specifically which friend it was, but uh, the alphabet workout. Could you tell us 
Yeah. Tell me the story about the alphabet workout. Yeah, so we were with uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, James James Toth is his name, and we grew up together. We know each other since fifth grade, and his wife Missy uh, had discovered. I don't know where she found it, but she told us about it, and Valerie uh, kind of picked it up and and uh, and told me about it, and I put it in the book. So the alphabet workout is you can, uh, and I'm sure I bet you can Google it and find it. Every letter is a different exercise, so, and you can assign it yourself or just go online and find it. But like an A is 10 push-ups, B is 10 sit-ups, C is maybe five squats, and it goes on and on and on. And so um, you now have all these exercises, and you can go online and just uh, randomly generate a word. And once that word comes out, you have to do all the exercises of all the letters that are in the word. And it's a way, so some days, you know, you're like, you generate the word, and you're like, cat, all right, this is an easy day. And then another day, you know, it's like hippopotamus, oh boy, this is going to be a tough workout. But it makes it just more fun and, um, and, uh, and, and, and makes it a little bit, um, you know, put, putting a little fun into it and not just being serious all the yeah. time. Yeah, it changes it up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you actually have it on your website. Oh, yeah. Okay, there it is. Yeah. I forgot it was there. <laughs> You do, yeah. Yeah, you go to dancrockerl.com backslash alphabet workout, boom. Okay, well, thanks right for there. reminding me of that. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I was here to help. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No, I, I think that's, for me anyway, that's why I, I'm not a, I don't like to run. There's a lot of people that are runners and they're, you know, they it clears their mind and they think, I get bored when I run. And I'm yes. like, what am I doing? Why, why am I out? It's not like I'm tired. I'm just, I'm bored. Right. Um, I was always, I liked, I played soccer in college and growing up and things like that. And you run a lot in, in soccer, but your mind is not fixed on running. It's fixed sure. on where do I need to be and where's the ball and all of those different things, you yep. know? So yep. uh, for me, finding routines that they keep it fun and exciting and different, um, it, that that's impactful for me. It's something that I was looking at it I'm, and I'm thinking about uh, giving it a shot, uh, doing the, at least I can commit to it for like a month and see how I do, you know, uh, yeah. with, the, with the alphabet workout. But you just know? keep it interesting. Yeah. And if you start with like small words like do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or instead of start, starting with strong by design, just start with by. See how it there goes. There you go. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> I could do it. Let's hear what, it, I'm going to look it up. It's, it's 12 push ups and 30 crunches. Okay. No problem. That's, that's pretty good. I can do that. It's a good start. All right, let's do it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> as soon as we're done. There you go. I'm doing it. We're going to do strong by design. All right. Uh, so leading self, obviously leading self is important. Uh, what about mental fitness? How, what do you do to keep mentally fit? Yeah, so I think a lot of this is um, mindset. And so there's there's no, I don't think I have a specific definition for mental fitness, but some of the things I practice and think about, uh, there's a great book by Ger Carol Dweck called Mindset, and it talks about the difference between a, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And there's been a lot of videos and TikTok videos and YouTube videos about this over the past few years, but a growth, a growth mindset basically says, I'm curious, I'm open-minded. Um, if there's something new to try, I'm going to try it because I want to get better at it. I may not be good at it at the beginning and I may fail, but by practicing and trying it, it's going to make me better. It's going to make me understand it more. I'm going to be vulnerable. Um, and a fixed mindset basically says, I don't want to try new things because I'm not going to be good at them. And I don't want to look foolish doing these things, or I don't want to lose my confidence. So I'm just going to keep doing the things that I'm good at doing over and over again. And it's a choice. It's a choice you can make. They did some experiments with, uh, with uh, little kids in a, a classroom, and they gave them puzzles. They said, you know, we'll give you a puzzle. And if you like the puzzle, you can come up and get another puzzle, or you can keep the puzzle you have. And, and during the course of the the experiment, some of the kids came back and got a harder puzzle from the teacher, and some kids just kept putting the same puzzle together over and over again. And so quickly, you could see which of the kids had a fixed mindset, which is, I'm going to stay in my box, and I'm just going to keep doing this one puzzle. And then other kids were like, all right, I figured this one out. Do you have another one I can do, or a harder one, so I can you know, be not get bored? And so that mental fitness thing is, uh, I think it's, if once you can get there, it really opens you up to try new things, be open to talk to strangers, 
Um, and when you're open to talk to people, when you're open to new ideas, uh, more more opportunities come up. And it's there's a um, I, I consider it a form of creating your own luck. You can become luckier by your mindset and by being open minded and being wanting to learn new things and being curious. And so that piece of the mental fitness, I think, is 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 really important. And uh, it's you know that ties into resiliency because uh, we have ups and downs all the time. I can tell you, working at Disney in a really high pressure job, big responsibility, there were good days and there were bad days that were really bad. And you have to learn how to bounce back from those and learn from those. And consulting, there was you know some days were like, what do we? We don't have anything lined up next month. What are we going to do? You know, how are we going to get paid? And then, um, and then things would come together. So I think the more you put yourself in these uncomfortable situations, the more resilient you get, and the more you're you're willing to sort of go out there and um, take risks and do new things. Now they need to be calculated. You know, you just can't go um, take these risks without thinking them through. But um, <laughs> But uh, it's a, it's it, you're much more in control when you can do that, and you're less scared. You're not sitting at night worrying about things. Although I had plenty of those nights, but I think this growth mindset says, you know what, I got a real short life. I'm going to go try things. There's stuff I'm not going to be able to do, but I'm going to learn from it. It's going to be another experience I'm going to have, and that's going to just add to my life experiences. And that's I think it's a it's kind of a hardy way to approach life. Yeah, you can you can learn a lot more and have a lot more experiences by leaving the house. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and by just staying at home and, and hoping that things are going to show up, you know? Right. Um, right. You got to go do things. I mean, sure. And, and then, I mean, there, obviously there's a balance there, you know, uh, but it's like throwing the seed, right? I can throw the seed on the ground. Uh, if I only throw it in one spot, either it works there or it doesn't work. But if I'm throwing seed in all over the place, well, now I can see where is it going to grow the best? And then you got to, got to pick and choose. So, yeah. um, I think there's a lot of value in, uh, doing your best to, to throw it out there and see, see where it's going to, where it's going to work. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great visual to help people think about. Uh, so we have physical well being. We're working on that. We're doing our alphabet workout. We have mental fitness where we're working towards mental fitness. We're reading Dan's book so that we can get more mentally strong. Uh, what about moral fitness? What, how does that, how does, how does that played into you in your life? Yeah. So the way I think about moral fitness, it really is, um, what are my values? What do I believe in? And then do I actually act out those values? Cause, cause you know, values are really represented by actions and behaviors. Everyone always talks about what they believe in, and we see so much hypocrisy today. People and a lot of politicians and a lot some leaders. This is what I believe in. You say, great. I don't ever see you do any of that. Uh, so you just and it's everyone. Only you can decide what your values are. You can't let other people define those for you. You have to decide who you want to be, what you want your reputation to be, what you want to be known for, and then you have to hold yourself accountable to those things. Uh-huh. So, you know what? I want to be a really good parent. Well, great. Do you have, do you get all your kids together and have dinner together every night? Or do you sit in front of the TV and, or let everyone go eat in a different place? Uh, I want to be known for supporting them. Well, great. Are you sitting down and talking to them about how they're feeling about things and helping them with their homework? Um, I want to be a good spouse. Well, good. Do you empty the trash can without being asked? Do you remember your wedding anniversary? Uh, do you, when you get frustrated, do you not take it out on your spouse? Uh, I want to be known for being accessible and approachable in my job. Okay, well, great. Are you getting out into your area? Are you talking to your employees? Are you, if they said, if they want to come meet with you, are you easy to meet with? So what do you want your reputation to be? Who do you want to, what do you want to be known for? What do you want people to, you know, kind of judge you on? Decide what those are and then make a list of behaviors and ways you're going to bring that to life. And that's how I think about moral (laughs) fitness. Yeah. Sounds like integrity to me as you're as you're talking. Like it's another way to it, talk am, am about doing, it. Yeah. yeah, am I doing what I say I'm going to do, right. whether anyone's looking or not? You know. Yeah, um, absolutely. We try to teach that to our. Yeah. And you call that I, I call it the gap that to to our kids all the time. Yeah, and talk to them about it all the time. And even when they, yeah, they're, they're, you don't think they're listening, they're listening. Uh-huh. Keep talking yeah. about it. They're going to remember it. And it's uh, yeah. I, I have a, a a concept I call the gap. It's what I want to be and what I'm doing to be there. And there's a gap. And am I closing that gap as much as I can? And some people 
their values are I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna have integrity as long as people are checking on me. But the minute I'm not being held accountable, I'll do something differently. Um, right. And so it's it's to your point. I think that's that's really well. When no one's looking and no one knows, what do you do? And that's that kind of defines who you are. And you're the only person who can judge it, and you're the only person who'll know about that. So it's uh, if you're waiting for other people to give you the thumbs up of you are who you should be. I think that's the worst thing you can do. Only you can define who you want to be. Yeah. Uh, and if you list out uh, all the words of these characteristics that you want to be, well, now you have a word for every day. Take yeah. it right back over to the old alphabet workout. Oh, my gosh. Know? There's some serious synergy it, right there. Yeah, there's so much, you know, crossover with all of these things. <laughs> that's right. That's a strong so, design. That's right. It's, it's, like, it's like it was made to be that way. Oh, it's so good. Um, so, uh, we have, uh, I, I love that leading yourself. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. Uh, you, you lead from yourself. I mean, I, I've taught that for a long time. We believe that, that, uh, if you're not, if you're not healthy, uh, and leading yourself well, how can you lead others well? And so when I mean, we always say lead yourself, lead your family, if you're leading your family well, okay, well now you're ready to lead others. Right. Um, and, uh, I don't know if you're, uh, uh, a, a faith guy or not, but that's definitely a, a, a scripture based thing too, you know, where you say, lead your family first. Uh, if you can prove to lead your family, okay, well now you're, you're equipped to lead others. And so, um, definitely, uh, I mean, I just love that. I fall right in line with that. So let's say I'm doing these things. Well, I, I'm leading myself. Well, I'm leading my family. Well, now I'm ready. I'm ready to step out. And I'm saying, okay, I think I, I'm being called and led to be a, a leader of other people. I know that you have leading teams and leading organizations. Um, I was going to look specifically at leading teams. Uh, what are some highlights uh, that you you would share uh, of what it takes to be a good leader when it comes to leading teams and other people? Sure. So I guess a little bit of structure here. Um, the first thing, and this is a, something that hit me years ago, is uh, when you're leading a team, it's not it's their it's their success. And if they have teams reporting to them, it's their success. And so if you're not making everyone in your organizational organization successful, now you may have one or two people reporting to you. You may have 10. They may have more. So the, the, the levels doesn't matter. But your job as a leader when you're in an organization is to make the organization successful. Get everyone to work towards the mission of the organization. And I think a lot of leaders get caught up in, well, as long as I can be the best leader and do my job well, that's all that counts. But what I learned at Disney, you know, being at the Magic Kingdom, for example, um, I you know, 12,000 employees in my organization. And if my leadership wasn't translating to our guests having great experiences with frontline employees, because that's who they talked to, the guests had no idea who I was. And they didn't care who I was. All they knew was okay. I pull up at the auto plaza, is this person friendly and welcoming, and do they know what they're doing? Do they park my car safely? Do they drive the tram safely and talk to me? Do they answer my questions? And you, know, you can go through the hundreds of interactions you'd have with someone in a theme park or all the employees in a theme park. If my leadership was not making that better, then I wasn't doing my job. So at Disney, we uh, and like a lot of organizations, we did a 360-degree survey, right? So every year and eventually every two years, your boss would rate you, your peers would rate you, and your direct reports would rate you, and you'd get all this feedback. And I used to always flip to the page where my, my, my team, my direct reports, what do they think about my leadership? And after a couple of years, it hit me that, you know what, that's important, but what's more important is what the 6,000 to 12,000 employees think about their leadership, because they're the ones, once again, who are creating the magic. They're at the moment of truth for the guests. So this is, I think, something you need to think about as a leader when you go into a new job or you're running a, a department. It's not about you. Leadership is not about you. It's about your team, and it's about getting everyone aligned to the mission, whatever that mission is, whether it's creating magical memories for guests, whether it's creating exceptional student experiences if you're running a university, whether it's um, safely, um, if you're in you know, law enforcement, keeping people safe. It's not about people. It's about the mission. And uh, there's so much ego out there. Uh, people always tend to forget that. They, they build their little fiefdoms and, and do that. So that's that's a, a leading one. And then there's four other things I always think about. I'm constantly thinking about when I'm leading teams. First one is talent. Do I have the right talent on my team? Do I have the right people working around me? 
Do we have the expertise we need? Do we have the right attitudes on the group? Do we have the right experiences? Do we have diversity of thought, diversity of uh, 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 experiences and, and ideas? Secondly, uh, am, I spend, am I building relationships with everybody? Now, that, that varies by culture. You know, living in France, you don't kind of get to know your employees really, really well because they're not there to become friends with someone they're working for. United States, it's a whole other level, right? You, you really talk to your employees. And so it's, it's different by culture, but do you have a respectful, trustful relationship with the people you're working with? Number three is setting clear expectations for performance. Do I know what it takes to be successful? Uh, it's like raising kids. Here's what time you have to be home. Here's what you can do. Here's how far out of the, the yard you can do if you're going to go outside and play. And employees need and managers need to know what their expectations are. And then lastly is reward and recognition, which is reinforcing the right behaviors. When you see the behaviors that you're looking for, you reinforce that with money, with thank yous, with um, whatever you're going to do to reinforce that. A lot of times just people knowing they're doing a good job is enough. And some people want to put your money where your mouth is. Give me more money or give me, uh, you know, buy me dinner or whatever that is. So you get your right, the right people on the team, you build relationships with them, you set clear expectations for performance, and you reward and recognize them when they do it well. That for me is what, you know, that's, that's, that was my framework and my model yeah. for leading teams yeah. over my career. It sounds like when you're cultivating a culture, you know, um, and uh, that's, all of those things are impacting the culture that uh, and and work the work culture that people are are being a part of. Um, I am curious uh, as as a leader, if you're hiring people on, you're building your team, uh, not necessarily from me uh, uh, being interviewed, but as the interviewer, do you have any do's and don'ts for a job interview? Yeah, uh, I'll 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 talk about another great book. Um, by um, um, Carol Quinn, another Carol. Uh, she wrote a, a book called Motivation Based Interviewing. And Valor and I have used that. We've used it to consult with, and we really believe strongly in it. And she basically lays out uh, when you're interviewing someone for a job, there's three things you're evaluating um, um, skills, passion, and attitude. Those are the three big ones. Skills, you know, at Disney, when they a lot of the employees they hire, you don't hire for skills because we're going to teach you how to load Pirates of the Caribbean, or we're going to teach you how to work at Pecos Bills, or we're going to teach you how to load Rock and Roller Coaster. So we don't need you to have skills because we'll teach it to you. And that's the true for many, many jobs today. Uh, number two is passion. Why do you want to work here? Why are you excited about working here? But the thing that she talks about, which we believe in really strongly, is the most important thing is attitude. And the way we like to define attitude is people who have a great attitude, they solve, they're problem solvers. They overcome barriers. They're able to solve problems. And that's what, that's, those are the people you want in your organization. So they don't come back with excuses of, I didn't have the right tools for the job, or it was really hard, or I don't know how to do that. People that have a great attitude figure things out. Um, you know, think about Navy SEALs. They have a great attitude because they adapt and overcome. That's their motto adapt and over, you know, they're going to figure this out. And so when you're interviewing, um, if you can ask people about that, how do you solve problems? Uh, and there's some great interview questions in the book. We don't, well, I won't dive all the way into that, but if you can interview mainly for attitude, you're going to pick the right kind of people. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can teach attitude, but you certainly yeah. uh, can raise the red flag when you're interviewing someone to figure out if they're more victims yeah. or they're really have an internal sense of wanting to get things done. Yeah. We always say it's it's harder to teach. If someone has the right heart, it's easier to teach them skills. If they have the skills and no heart, it's really hard to. I agree. You know, have put, put the heart into somebody. I so, agree. Not that it's impossible, but it's a lot more challenging yeah. for sure. Yep. Um, yeah, that's one. Uh, uh, the business that I work for is not actually strong by design. It's critical bench, and the owner Mike always talks about hiring A plus plus people. You know, um, and really taking your time during the interview process to hire the right people. Because it's you, you really, even though it, it takes more time, you're you're saving yourself in the long run from hiring the wrong people. Oh, it's so true. Life gets so much easier when you have the, the you know a plus players around you. It's more fun. You have more success. They're happier, uh, and you just got to be careful. Don't settle. Don't settle because yeah. you like somebody. Really mm -hmm. uh, look at how they're going to achieve the job and what they're going to do. 
And if you can figure that out, everything gets better. Because once again, it's not about you and your relationship with that direct report. It's their ability to work towards the mission of the organization. And that has to be the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So working at Disney, you must have had a lot of fun experiences. Um, Is there any in particular experience uh, that really just stands out that you're like, man, this was probably the coolest person that I met or one of the most exciting things that we got to do because of my job at Disney was blank. Yeah. Uh, Gosh. There's, I'm sure there's a lot. There's there's a laundry list. And, you know, the, the when we opened the gates on April 12th, 1992, and the first car drove through the auto plaza and I was standing there, yeah, I saw no. the first guest come in the park and I knew that was yeah. a historical moment. And that was pretty cool. Um, he pulled out your iPhone. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I had a big brick, a big radio brick yeah. <laughs> back in the day. Um, yeah. That was even before the Palm Pilot. I mean, that was way before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So- um, It's like the Zach Morris telephone. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Pulling up one morning at Disneyland Paris when I was working in parking, and there was a bus full of Germans who had driven all night and got there like three in the morning, and they had their barbecues out, and they were out you know, barbecuing bratwurst and drinking big- big leaders of beer before they went to the park. I thought that was an awesome day. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> being at Epcot as the duty manager on uh, uh, 19 December 31st, 1999, and at the stroke of midnight, wa- looking at the park and hoping all the lights didn't go out because of the, yep. the Y2K, Y2K stuff. Y2K, yep. Uh, that was a pretty big moment. Um, and then, you know, being at, uh, you know, at Magic Kingdom on New Year's Eve, I mean, those were incredible moments just when you have, you know, 60, 70,000 people in the park and all the fireworks going. But those were all fun stories and fun moments. But for me, it always came back to people, the stories, the, the stories, the people I worked with, the guests that came there, the incredible stories they had, you know, meeting guests who said, this is my last trip to Walt Disney World because I'm terminally ill and I wanted to bring my family here before that ended, you know, so much courage. Um, the, the, the employees and the cast members who just would, would bend over backwards to figure things out for guests. Cause this, this weight of responsibility you have when you're wearing that Disney name tag and watching them, um, and how they, they got so emotional about this and watching the guests and their expectations. And that was probably the thing I, I got to see almost every day, but it was pretty inspirational to be in an environment like that where everyone, um, plays hard and works hard. And we don't take each other's ourselves too seriously, but we take our job extremely seriously because of the the expectations the guests had uh, because of that Disney brand. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was incredible. I, every day I went into work, I was nervous. Am I going to be able to perform today? Am I going to be able to keep up with everyone else? It's uh, it's a pretty intense job, but it's very fulfilling. Sure. Did you ever have? Uh, I mean, obviously Disney's putting out movies and different things like that. Did you have? celebrities come in that you thought, uh, man, this was fun uh, to be able to work with this individual or, I mean, I, I know I've seen, like the one thing that pops out to me is, I don't, I don't know if you were there when this happened, but like Johnny Depp pretending to be Jack Sparrow, like in Pirates of the Caribbean, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I heard that story. I, maybe, I don't know if that was a Disneyland or Walt Disney World that he did that, but um, yeah, we there was, there was lots of celebrities coming through. Most of the time, um, you know, we had VIP services, they were taking care of them. And at Disney, you know, we're not there to be awestruck. We're there to take care of everybody sure, and do that. Sure. But, uh, one, one, I'll tell you a quick story that was kind of, uh, fun. So when I was at Disneyland Paris, I was working in guest relations. I was a frontline manager and I got a call one morning and, uh, and my Valor and I had a roommate, Alessandra, uh, who's from Sicily and we were at breakfast, the phone rang. I'm like, yep. Okay. Yep all right, I'll be in. I'm like, I got to go. They're like, what's going on? I said, well, we have a, a VIP today, wants to see the park before the park opens. They're like, who is it? I'm like, you know what? I can't tell you. It's confidential. I, mm-hmm. I could have told them, but I just really wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I go to the park and I get home that night. They're like, so who was it? Who was a VIP? I said, all right, here's the story. I said, I got to the park and um, I got the a car. We used a car to transport. And I went to the front of the Disneyland Hotel and it was the uh, the president of uh, Euro Disney uh, at the time. It was Steve Burke and the general manager of uh, operations, Eric Paul, a Dutch guy, and Michael Douglas. 
and they were with them. And Michael Douglas really wanted to see Frontierland because Frontierland at, at Disneyland Paris is really awesome. They did a really great job. So I drove them into the park. They got it, did the tour. Um, yeah, Michael Douglas didn't say a word to me because he was with the president. You know, I was just a frontline manager. We get back to Disneyland Hotel and I'm telling the story to Valerie and, and Alessandra, like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. I said, Michael Douglas got out of the car and he started working t- walking towards the, the hotel and he stopped and he turned around and he walked back to the driver's side window and I rolled it down. I said, yes, Mr. Douglas, what can I do for you? He said, what's your name? I said, uh, Dan Cockrell. He goes, have you ever thought about being in the movies, being a, you know, an actor? I said, no, sir, I haven't. He goes, you should think about that. And he turned around and went into the hotel and they're dying. They're like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. I'm like, all right. That whole story was true, except the part when I talked to Michael Douglas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was fun. Oh, man. That's funny. Yeah. That's fun, though. I mean, uh, just, uh, I guess uh, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up here. My, yes. my next question, now that you've been out of Disney for a little while, um, do you feel like uh, as we keep moving, we're like storm rolling forward, and I know that, there's a lot of different things that go on politically and things along those lines. But do you feel like the the essence of, of who Disney was 20 years ago remains today? Um, or does it feel like it's it's altering a little? Yeah. Well, you know, it's this is the classic one. When you're on the outside, you're like, well, it's not like when I was there. It's not as good as right. it was. And, um, right. And I think, I think the world has moved in a different direction. Uh, and... Um, Politics, you know, uh, organizations now can't stay neutral. They have to get into the fray. And um, some organizations get caught up in that and some navigate it. But it's really, it's become much more complex. The world has come. And and um, I think Disney continues. I think their, their values are still there. Figuring out how to execute that the right way on a regular basis is, is hard. And it's always hard. Being able to... Um, and I know a few things like when I was for years, Disney was kind of a place where, you know, if you're middle America, that's your, that everyone goes there. It's kind of a ritual. And today you look across the United States, you're like, can you, I afford to go there? It's become yeah, a very right. expensive place, but so is football games and baseball games. Everything's more oh, yeah. expensive today. And mm-hmm. the wealth gap is getting bigger. So I think not only is Disney navigating that and they got to deal with, you know, the creativity. Are they going to put out the right movies? Are they building the right attractions? You know all those things that come along with it, and the, with social media now, they're much more under a lot more scrutiny than when I was there. Um, sure. And at the same time, the world is progressing. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that are much better at Disney than when I was there, and there's things that have changed that I don't think are as good. And um, that's that's just how things change, and that's how life moves on. Uh, but but at the end of the day, the the thing I always talked about when we would talk internally about whether we should make this decision or that decision, we decided, you know what? Customers, guests are going to vote with their dollars. You, know, you can talk all day long about what people say about you. And it looks from what I've seen is those parks are still packed. So no matter what people are talking about with politics and, and as the company change everything, people are showing up in droves and they're paying a lot of money to be there. So that's for me the final test. As soon as the, people don't think they're getting the value, they won't they'll stop going and Disney will have to relook at that and they're they'll continue to re reexamine it. But um people vote with their dollars and uh if they show up then they must value it. Yep. I can tell you uh with a uh four kids the world is not set up for four children. <laughs> it is not. Yeah, yeah. maybe 3 uh-huh. plus two parents. Yeah, two parents and two kids. That's a great match because you know table for yeah. four, you can get that. Yeah, but you all are uh, you're, every, you're definitely every, an outlier. Yeah, they're they're like, hey, you can win this trip for our family vacation, but you only get to bring two of your children, so the other two have to stay home. <laughs> yeah, that seems problematic. Yeah, it is a little bit. So, well, thank you so much, Dan, for taking this time. Uh, I know you have a lot on your plate. You're getting ready for the big move and, and all yes. of those things. But yeah. to take a, a little bit of time out to, to speak with me and to uh, just, uh, again, I love hearing your stories. I love, uh, again, if you uh, haven't gotten it or if you've gotten this far and you haven't realized that he wrote this book, then there's probably something wrong with you because you haven't <laughs> been listening to the podcast. But, uh, hey, go look at this book. How's the culture in your kingdom? Uh, you can get it. it I know you can get it on Amazon. Is there anywhere else you prefer them to buy it from? 
uh, wherever you buy books, you know, I always, it's always yeah. nice to go into your independent bookstore and request it, give them a little business, but I know Amazon sure. is so convenient. Um, so, uh, yeah. but at wherever you buy books and I'll plug my wife's book, Valerie wrote a book in October, 2023, and it's called manage like a mother and Valerie Cockerell. So we be, we each have a book now and I think she's going to sell Great. a lot more books than I did. You're both but, real now. Yeah, that's right. We know what we're talking about. <laughs> Uh, no, that's good. I, I love it. Yeah, I'll, I'll be sure to check that out as well. Uh, maybe uh, I'll, I'll chat with you. Maybe we can get her on as well if she wants to come. And uh, maybe after you guys are settled uh, in, in Australia, we could That'd be great. get her on the show. That'd be great. So thank you again, uh, Dan. Appreciate you. Have a great trip. Uh, and please uh, go. We'll, we'll make sure to put the link uh, in, in our description below. So go, go check out his book and uh, blessings to you. Thank you so much for listening to the Strong by Design podcast. If you found value in today's episode, please subscribe so that more people can find out about our show. Plus, you don't want to miss any future episodes with the amazing guests and topics we have lined up for you.